the world as it appears to us now is, as I said, largely a reflection of the egoic mind. Fear being an unavoidable consequence of egoic delusion, it is a world dominated by fear. Just as the images in a dream are symbols of inner states and feelings, so our collective reality is largely a symbolic expression of fear and of the heavy layers of negativity that have accumulated in the collective human psyche. We are not separate from our world, so when the majority of humans become free of egoic delusion, this inner change will affect all of creation. You will literally inhabit a new world. It is a shift in planetary consciousness. The strange Buddhist saying that every tree and every blade of grass will eventually become enlightened points to the same truth. According to St. Paul, the whole of creation is waiting for humans to become enlightened. That is how I interpret his saying that the created universe is waiting with eager expectation for God's sons to be revealed. St. Paul goes on to say that all of creation will become redeemed through this. Up to the present, the whole created universe in all its parts groans as if in the pangs of childbirth. What is being born is a new consciousness and, as its inevitable reflection, a new world. This is also foretold in the New Testament book of Revelation. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. But don't confuse cause and effect. Your primary task is not to seek salvation through creating a better world, but to awaken out of identification with form. You are then no longer bound to this world, this level of reality. You can feel your roots in the unmanifested and so are free of attachment to the manifested world. You can still enjoy the passing pleasures of this world, but there is no fear of loss anymore so you don't need to cling to them. Although you can enjoy sensory pleasures, the craving for sensory experience is gone, as is the constant search for fulfillment through psychological gratification, through feeding the ego. You are in touch with something infinitely greater than any pleasure, greater than any manifested thing. In a way, you then don't need the world anymore. You don't even need it to be different from the way it is. It is only at this point that you begin to make a real contribution towards bringing about a better world, towards creating a different order of reality. It is only at this point that you are able to feel true compassion and to help others at the level of cause. Only those who have transcended the world can bring about a better world. You may remember that we talked about the dual nature of true compassion, which is awareness of a common bond of shared mortality and immortality. At this deep level, compassion becomes healing in the widest sense. In that state, your healing influence is primarily based not on doing, but on being. Everybody you come in contact with will be touched by your presence, and affected by the peace that you emanate, whether they are conscious of it or not. When you are fully present and people around you manifest unconscious behavior, you won't feel the need to react to it, so you don't give it any reality. Your peace is so vast and deep that anything that is not peace disappears into it as if it had never existed. This breaks the karmic cycle of action and reaction. Animals, trees, flowers, will feel your peace and respond to it. You teach through being, through demonstrating the peace of God. You become the light of the world, an emanation of pure consciousness, and so you eliminate suffering on the level of cause. You eliminate unconsciousness from the world. This doesn't mean that you may not also teach through doing, for example, by pointing out how to disidentify from the mind, recognize unconscious patterns within yourself, and so on. 
but who you are is always a more vital teaching and a more powerful transformer of the world than what you say, and more essential even than what you do. Furthermore, to recognize the primacy of being, and thus work on the level of cause, does not exclude the possibility that your compassion may simultaneously manifest on the level of doing and of effect, by alleviating suffering whenever you come across it. When a hungry person asks you for bread and you have some, you will give it. But as you give the bread, even though your interaction may only be very brief, what really matters is this moment of shared being, of which the bread is only a symbol. A deep healing takes place within it. In that moment, there is no giver, no receiver. But there shouldn't be any hunger and starvation in the first place. How can we create a better world without tackling evils such as hunger and violence first? All evils are the effect of unconsciousness. You can alleviate the effects of unconsciousness, but you cannot eliminate them unless you eliminate their cause. True change happens within, not without. If you feel called upon to alleviate suffering in the world, that is a very noble thing to do. But remember not to focus exclusively on the outer. Otherwise you will encounter frustration and despair. Without a profound change in human consciousness, the world's suffering is a bottomless pit. So don't let your compassion become one-sided. Empathy with someone else's pain or lack and a desire to help need to be balanced with a deeper realization of the eternal nature of all life and the ultimate illusion of all pain. Then let your peace flow into whatever you do and you will be working on the levels of effect and cause simultaneously. This also applies if you are supporting a movement designed to stop deeply unconscious humans from destroying themselves, each other and the planet or from continuing to inflict dreadful suffering on other sentient beings. Remember, just as you cannot fight the darkness, so you cannot fight unconsciousness. If you try to do so, the polar opposites will become strengthened and more deeply entrenched. You will become identified with one of the polarities. You will create an enemy and so be drawn into unconsciousness yourself. Raise awareness by disseminating information, or at the most, practice passive resistance. But make sure that you carry no resistance within, no hatred, no negativity. Love your enemies, said Jesus, which of course means have no enemies. Once you get involved in working on the level of effect, it is all too easy to lose yourself in it. Stay alert and very, very present. The causal level needs to remain your primary focus, the teaching of enlightenment your main purpose, and peace your most precious gift to the world. Chapter 10 The Meaning of Surrender You mentioned surrender a few times. I don't like that idea. It sounds somewhat fatalistic. If we always accept the way things are, we aren't going to make any effort to improve them. It seems to me what progress is all about, both in our personal lives and collectively, is not to accept the limitations of the present, but to strive to go beyond them and create something better. If we hadn't done this, we would still be living in caves. How do you reconcile surrender with changing things and getting things done. To some people, surrender may have negative connotations, implying defeat, giving up, failing to rise to the challenges of life, becoming lethargic and so on. True surrender, however, is something entirely different. It does not mean to passively put up with whatever situation you find yourself in and to do nothing about it. Nor does it mean to cease making plans or initiating positive action. Surrender is the simple but profound wisdom of yielding to, rather than opposing, the flow of life. 
The only place where you can experience the flow of life is the now. So to surrender is to accept the present moment unconditionally and without reservation. It is to relinquish inner resistance to what is. Inner resistance is to say no to what is, through mental judgments and emotional negativity. It becomes particularly pronounced when things go wrong, which means that there's a gap between the demands or rigid expectations of your mind and what is. That is the pain gap. If you have lived long enough, you will know that things go wrong quite often. It is precisely at those times that surrender needs to be practiced if you want to eliminate pain and sorrow from your life. Acceptance of what is immediately frees you from mind identification and thus reconnects you with being. Resistance is the mind. Surrender is a purely inner phenomenon. It does not mean that on the outer level you cannot take action and change the situation. In fact, it is not the overall situation that you need to accept when you surrender, but just the tiny segment called the now. For example, if you were stuck in the mud somewhere, you wouldn't say, OK, I resign myself to being stuck in the mud. Resignation is not surrender. You don't need to accept an undesirable or unpleasant life situation. Nor do you need to deceive yourself and say that there's nothing wrong with being stuck in the mud. No. You recognize fully that you want to get out of it. You then narrow your attention down to the present moment without mentally labeling it in any way. This means that there's no judgment of the now. Therefore, there's no resistance, no emotional negativity. You accept the isness of this moment. Then you take action and do all that you can to get out of the mud. Such action I call positive action. It is far more effective than negative action, which arises out of anger, despair or frustration. Until you achieve the desired result, you continue to practice surrender by refraining from labeling the now. Let me give you a visual analogy to illustrate the point I'm making. You are walking along a path at night, surrounded by a thick fog. But you have a powerful flashlight that cuts through the fog and creates a narrow, clear space in front of you. The fog is your life situation, which includes past and future. The flashlight is your conscious presence. The clear space is the now. Non-surrender hardens your psychological form, the shell of the ego, and so creates a strong sense of separateness. The world around you and people in particular come to be perceived as threatening. The unconscious compulsion to destroy others through judgment arises, as does the need to compete and dominate. Even nature becomes your enemy and your perceptions and interpretations are governed by fear. The mental disease that we call paranoia is only a slightly more acute form of this normal but dysfunctional state of consciousness. Not only your psychological form, but also your physical form, your body, becomes hard and rigid through resistance. Tension arises in different parts of the body, and the body as a whole contracts. The free flow of life energy through the body which is essential for its healthy functioning, is greatly restricted. Body work and certain forms of physical therapy can be helpful in restoring this flow, but unless you practice surrender in your everyday life, those things can only give temporary symptom relief since the cause, the resistance pattern, has not been dissolved. There is something within you that remains unaffected by the transient circumstances that make up your life situation and only through surrender do you have access to it. It is your life, your very being, which exists eternally in the timeless realm of the present. Finding this life is the one thing that is needed that Jesus talked about. If you find your life situation unsatisfactory or even intolerable, it is only by surrendering first that you can break the unconscious resistance pattern that perpetuates that situation. 
Surrender is perfectly compatible with taking action, initiating change or achieving goals. But in the surrendered state, a totally different energy, a different quality flows into your doing. Surrender reconnects you with the source energy of being. And if your doing is infused with being, it becomes a joyful celebration of life energy that takes you more deeply into the now. Through non-resistance, the quality of your consciousness and therefore the quality of whatever you are doing or creating is enhanced immeasurably. The results will then look after themselves and reflect that quality. We could call this surrendered action. It is not work as we have known it for thousands of years. As more humans awaken, the word work is going to disappear from our vocabulary and perhaps a new word will be created to replace it. It is the quality of your consciousness at this moment that is the main determinant of what kind of future you will experience. So to surrender is the most important thing you can do to bring about positive change. Any action you take is secondary. No truly positive action can arise out of an unsurrendered state of consciousness. I can see that if I'm in a situation that is unpleasant or unsatisfactory and I completely accept the moment as it is, there will be no suffering or unhappiness. I will have risen above it. But I still can't quite see where the energy or motivation for taking action and bringing about change would come from if there isn't a certain amount of dissatisfaction. In the state of surrender, you see very clearly what needs to be done, and you take action, doing one thing at a time and focusing on one thing at a time. Learn from nature. See how everything gets accomplished and how the miracle of life unfolds without dissatisfaction or unhappiness. That's why Jesus said, Look at the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. If your overall situation is unsatisfactory or unpleasant, separate out this instant and surrender to what is. That's the flashlight cutting through the fog. Your state of consciousness then ceases to be controlled by external conditions. You are no longer coming from reaction and resistance. Then look at the specifics of the situation. Ask yourself, is there anything I can do to change the situation, improve it or remove myself from it? If so, you take appropriate action. Focus not on the 100 things that you will or may have to do at some future time, but on the one thing that you can do now. This doesn't mean that you should not do any planning. It may well be that planning is the one thing that you can do now. But make sure that you don't start to run mental movies, project yourself into the future and so lose the now. Any action you take may not bear fruit immediately. Until it does, do not resist what is. If there is no action you can take, and you cannot remove yourself from the situation, then use the situation to make you go more deeply into surrender, more deeply into the now, more deeply into being. When you enter this timeless dimension of the present, change often comes about in strange ways without the need for a great deal of doing on your part. Life becomes helpful and cooperative. If inner factors such as fear, guilt or inertia prevented you from taking action, they will dissolve in the light of your conscious presence. Do not confuse surrender with an attitude of I can't be bothered anymore or I just don't care anymore. If you look at it closely, you will find that such an attitude is tainted with negativity in the form of hidden resentment and so is not surrender at all but masked resistance. As you surrender, direct your attention inward to check if there is any trace of resistance left inside you. Be very alert when you do so. Otherwise, a pocket of resistance may continue to hide in some dark corner in the form of a thought or an unacknowledged emotion. Letting go of resistance is easier said than done. I still don't see clearly how to let go. 
If you say it is by surrendering, the question remains, how? Start by acknowledging that there is resistance. Be there when it happens, when the resistance arises. Observe how your mind creates it, how it labels the situation, yourself or others. Look at the thought process involved. Feel the energy of the emotion. By witnessing the resistance, you will see that it serves no purpose. By focusing all your attention on the now, the unconscious resistance is made conscious, and that is the end of it. You cannot be conscious and unhappy, conscious and in negativity. Negativity, unhappiness or suffering in whatever form means that there is resistance, and resistance is always unconscious. Surely I can be conscious of my unhappy feelings. Would you choose unhappiness? If you did not choose it, how did it arise? What is its purpose? Who is keeping it alive? You say that you are conscious of your unhappy feelings, but the truth is that you are identified with them and keep the process alive through compulsive thinking. All that is unconscious. If you were conscious, that is to say totally present in the now, all negativity would dissolve almost instantly. It could not survive in your presence. It can only survive in your absence. Even the pain body cannot survive for long in your presence. You keep your unhappiness alive by giving it time. That is its lifeblood. Remove time through intense present moment awareness and it dies. But do you want it to die? Have you truly had enough? Who would you be without it? Until you practice surrender, the spiritual dimension is something you read about, talk about, get excited about, write books about, think about, believe in, or don't, as the case may be. It makes no difference. Not until you surrender does it become a living reality in your life. When you do, the energy that you emanate and which then runs your life is of a much higher vibrational frequency than the mind energy that still runs our world, the energy that created the existing social, political and economic structures of our civilization, and which also continuously perpetuates itself through our educational systems and the media. Through surrender, spiritual energy comes into this world. It creates no suffering for yourself, for other humans, or any other life form on the planet. Unlike mind energy, it does not pollute the earth, and it is not subject to the law of polarities, which dictates that nothing can exist without its opposite, that there can be no good without bad. Those who run on mind energy, which is still the vast majority of the earth's population, remain unaware of the existence of spiritual energy. It belongs to a different order of reality and will create a different world when a sufficient number of humans enter the surrendered state and so become totally free of negativity. If the earth is to survive, this will be the energy of those who inhabit it. Jesus referred to this energy when he made his famous prophetic statement in the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the gentle, they shall have the earth for their possession. It is a silent but intense presence that dissolves the unconscious patterns of the mind. They may still remain active for a while, but they won't run your life anymore. The external conditions that were being resisted also tend to shift or dissolve quickly through surrender. It is a powerful transformer of situations and people. If conditions do not shift immediately, your acceptance of the now enables you to rise above them. Either way, you're free. What about people who want to use me, manipulate or control me? Am I to surrender to them? They are cut off from being, so they unconsciously attempt to get energy and power from you. It is true that only an unconscious person will try to use or manipulate others but it is equally true that only an unconscious person can be used and manipulated. If you resist or fight unconscious behavior in others, 
you become unconscious yourself. But surrender doesn't mean that you allow yourself to be used by unconscious people. Not at all. It is perfectly possible to say no firmly and clearly to a person or to walk away from a situation and be in a state of complete inner non-resistance at the same time. When you say no to a person or situation, let it come not from reaction but from insight, from a clear realization of what is right or not right for you at that moment. Let it be a non-reactive no, a high-quality no, a no that is free of all negativity and so creates no further suffering. I'm in a situation at work that's unpleasant. I've tried to surrender to it, but I find it impossible. A lot of resistance keeps coming up. If you cannot surrender, take action immediately. Speak up or do something to bring about a change in the situation, or remove yourself from it. Take responsibility for your life. Do not pollute your beautiful, radiant inner being nor the earth with negativity. Do not give unhappiness in any form whatsoever a dwelling place inside you. If you cannot take action, for example if you are in prison, then you have two choices left, resistance or surrender bondage or inner freedom from external conditions, suffering or inner peace. Is non-resistance also to be practiced in the external conduct of our lives, such as non-resistance to violence, or is it something that just concerns our inner life? You only need to be concerned with the inner aspect. That is primary. Of course, that will also transform the conduct of your outer life, your relationships, and so on. Your relationships will be changed profoundly by surrender. If you can never accept what is, by implication you will not be able to accept anybody the way they are. You will judge, criticize, label, reject, or attempt to change people. Furthermore, if you continuously make the now into a means to an end in the future, you will also make every person you encounter or relate with into a means to an end. The relationship, the human being, is then of secondary importance to you or of no importance at all. What you can get out of the relationship is primary, be it material gain, a sense of power, physical pleasure or some form of ego gratification. Let me illustrate how surrender can work in relationships. When you become involved in an argument or some conflict situation, perhaps with a partner or someone close to you, start by observing how defensive you become as your own position is attacked, or feel the force of your own aggression as you attack the other person's position. Observe the attachment to your views and opinions. Feel the mental-emotional energy behind your need to be right and make the other person wrong. That's the energy of the egoic mind. You make it conscious by acknowledging it, by feeling it as fully as possible. Then one day, in the middle of an argument, you will suddenly realize that you have a choice and you may decide to drop your own reaction, just to see what happens. You surrender. I don't mean dropping the reaction just verbally by saying, OK, you're right, with a look on your face that says, I'm above all this childish unconsciousness. That's just displacing the resistance to another level, with the egoic mind still in charge, claiming superiority. I'm speaking of letting go of the entire mental-emotional energy field inside you that was fighting for power. The ego is cunning, so you have to be very alert, very present and totally honest with yourself to see whether you have truly relinquished your identification with a mental position and so freed yourself from your mind. If you suddenly feel very light, clear and deeply at peace, that is an unmistakable sign that you have truly surrendered. Then observe what happens to the other person's mental position as you no longer energize it through resistance. When identification with mental positions is out of the way, true communication begins. 
What about non-resistance in the face of violence, aggression and the like? Non-resistance doesn't necessarily mean doing nothing. All it means is that any doing becomes non-reactive. Remember the deep wisdom underlying the practice of Eastern martial arts. Don't resist the opponent's force. Yield to overcome. Having said that, doing nothing when you're in a state of intense presence is a very powerful transformer and healer of situations and people. In Taoism, there is a term called Bu Wei, which is usually translated as actionless activity, or sitting quietly doing nothing. In ancient China, this was regarded as one of the highest achievements or virtues. It is radically different from inactivity in the ordinary state of consciousness, or rather unconsciousness, which stems from fear, inertia or indecision. The real doing nothing implies inner non-resistance and intense alertness. On the other hand, if action is required, you will no longer react from your conditioned mind, but you will respond to the situation out of your conscious presence. In that state, your mind is free of concepts, including the concept of non-violence. So who can predict what you will do? The ego believes that in your resistance lies your strength, whereas in truth, resistance cuts you off from being the only place of true power. Resistance is weakness and fear masquerading as strength. What the ego sees as weakness is your being in its purity, innocence and power. What it sees as strength is weakness. So the ego exists in a continuous resistance mode and plays counterfeit roles to cover up your weakness, which in truth is your power. Until they surrender, unconscious role-playing constitutes a large part of human interaction. In surrender, you no longer need ego defenses and false masks. You become very simple, very real. That's dangerous, says the ego. You will get hurt. You will become vulnerable. What the ego doesn't know, of course, is that only through the letting go of resistance, through becoming vulnerable, can you discover your true and essential invulnerability. If someone seriously ill and completely accepts their condition and surrenders to the illness, would they not have given up their will to get back to health? the determination to fight the illness would not be there anymore, would it? Surrender is inner acceptance of what is without any reservations. We are talking about your life, this instant, not the conditions or circumstances of your life, not what I call your life situation. We have spoken about this already. With regard to illness, this is what it means. Illness is part of your life situation. As such, it has a past and a future. Past and future form an uninterrupted continuum unless the redeeming power of the now is activated through your conscious presence. As you know, underneath the various conditions that make up your life situation, which exists in time, there is something deeper, more essential. Your life, your very being in the timeless now. As there are no problems in the now, there is no illness either. The belief in a label that someone attaches to your condition keeps the condition in place, empowers it, and makes a seemingly solid reality out of a temporary imbalance. It gives it not only reality and solidity, but also a continuity in time that it did not have before. By focusing on this instant and refraining from labeling it mentally, Illness is reduced to one or several of these factors, physical pain, weakness, discomfort, or disability. That is what you surrender to, now. You do not surrender to the idea of illness. Allow the suffering to force you into the present moment, into a state of intense conscious presence. Use it for enlightenment. Surrender does not transform what is, at least not directly. Surrender transforms you. When you are transformed, 
Your whole world is transformed because the world is only a reflection. We spoke about this earlier. If you looked in the mirror and did not like what you saw, you would have to be mad to attack the image in the mirror. That is precisely what you do when you are in a state of non-acceptance. And of course, if you attack the image, it attacks you back. If you accept the image, no matter what it is, if you become friendly towards it, it cannot not become friendly towards you. That is how you change the world. Illness is not the problem. You are the problem, as long as the egoic mind is in control. When you are ill or disabled, do not feel that you have failed in some way. Do not feel guilty. Do not blame life for treating you unfairly, but do not blame yourself either. All that is resistance. If you have a major illness, use it for enlightenment. Anything bad that happens in your life, use it for enlightenment. Withdraw time from the illness. Do not give it any past or future. Let it force you into intense present moment awareness and see what happens. Become an alchemist. Transmute base metal into gold, suffering into consciousness, disaster into enlightenment. Are you seriously ill and feeling angry now about what I have just said? Then that is a clear sign that the illness has become part of your sense of self and that you are now protecting your identity as well as protecting the illness. The condition that is labeled illness has nothing to do with who you truly are. As far as the still unconscious majority of the population is concerned, only a critical limit situation has the potential to crack the hard shell of ego and force them into surrender and so into the awakened state. A limit situation arises when through some disaster, drastic upheaval, deep loss or suffering, your whole world is shattered and doesn't make sense anymore. It is an encounter with death, be it physical or psychological. The egoic mind, the creator of this world, collapses. Out of the ashes of the old world, a new world can then come into being. There is no guarantee, of course, that even a limit situation will do it, but the potential is always there. Some people's resistance to what is even intensifies in such a situation, and so it becomes a descent into hell. In others, there may only be partial surrender, but even that will give them a certain depth and serenity that were not there before. Parts of the ego shall break off, and this allows small amounts of the radiance and peace that lie beyond the mind to shine through. Limit situations have produced many miracles. There have been murderers in death row waiting for execution who, in the last few hours of their lives, experienced the ego estate and the deep joy and peace that come with it. The inner resistance to the situation they found themselves in became so intense as to produce unbearable suffering, and there was nowhere to run and nothing to do to escape it, not even a mind-projected future. So they were forced into complete acceptance of the unacceptable. They were forced into surrender. In this way, they were able to enter the state of grace with which comes redemption, complete release from the past. Of course, it is not really the limit situation that makes room for the miracle of grace and redemption, but the act of surrender. So whenever any kind of disaster strikes, or something goes seriously wrong, illness, disability, loss of home or fortune, or of a socially defined identity, break up of a close relationship, death or suffering of a loved one, or your own impending death. Know that there is another side to it, that you are just one step away from something incredible, a complete alchemical transmutation of the base metal of pain and suffering into gold. That one step is called surrender. I do not mean to say that you will become happy in such a situation. You will not. 
but fear and pain will become transmuted into an inner peace and serenity that come from a very deep place, from the unmanifested itself. It is the peace of God which passes all understanding. Compared to that, happiness is quite a shallow thing. With this radiant peace comes the realization, not on the level of mind, but within the depth of your being, that you are indestructible, immortal. This is not a belief. It is absolute certainty that needs no external evidence or proof from some secondary source. I read about a Stoic philosopher in ancient Greece who when he was told that his son had died in an accident replied, I knew he was not immortal. Is that surrender? If it is, I don't want it. There are some situations in which surrender seems unnatural and inhuman. Being cut off from your feelings is not surrender. But we don't know what his inner state was when he said those words. In certain extreme situations, it may still be impossible for you to accept the now. But you always get a second chance at surrender. Your first chance is to surrender each moment to the reality of that moment, knowing that what is cannot be undone because it already is. You say yes to what is or accept what isn't. Then you do what you have to do, whatever the situation requires. If you abide in this state of acceptance, you create no more negativity, no more suffering, no more unhappiness. You then live in a state of non-resistance, a state of grace and lightness, free of struggle. Whenever you are unable to do that, whenever you miss that chance, either because you are not generating enough conscious presence to prevent some habitual and unconscious resistance pattern from arising, or because the condition is so extreme as to be absolutely unacceptable to you, then you are creating some form of pain, some form of suffering. It may look as if the situation is creating the suffering, but ultimately this is not so. Your resistance is. Now here's your second chance at surrender. If you cannot accept what is outside, then accept what is inside. If you cannot accept the external condition, accept the internal condition. This means, do not resist the pain. Allow it to be there. Surrender to the grief, despair, fear, loneliness, or whatever form the suffering takes. Witness it without labeling it mentally. Embrace it. Then see how the miracle of surrender transmutes deep suffering into deep peace. This is your crucifixion. Let it become your resurrection and ascension. I don't see how one can surrender to suffering. As you yourself pointed out, suffering is non-surrender. How could you surrender to non-surrender? Forget about surrender for a moment. When your pain is deep, all talk of surrender will probably seem futile and meaningless anyway. When your pain is deep, you will likely have a strong urge to escape from it rather than surrender to it. You don't want to feel what you feel. What could be more normal? But there is no escape, no way out. There are many pseudo-escapes, work, drink, drugs, anger, projection, suppression, and so on, but they don't free you from the pain. Suffering does not diminish in intensity when you make it unconscious. When you deny emotional pain, everything you do or think, as well as your relationships, become contaminated with it. You broadcast it, so to speak, as the energy you emanate, and others will pick it up subliminally. If they are unconscious, they may even feel compelled to attack or hurt you in some way, or you may hurt them in an unconscious projection of your pain. You attract and manifest whatever corresponds to your inner state. When there is no way out, there is still always a way through. So don't turn away from the pain. 
Face it. Feel it fully. Feel it. Don't think about it. Express it if necessary, but don't create a script in your mind around it. Give all your attention to the feeling, not to the person, event or situation that seems to have caused it. Don't let the mind use the pain to create a victim identity for yourself out of it. Feeling sorry for yourself and telling others your story will keep you stuck in suffering. Since it is impossible to get away from the feeling, the only possibility of change is to move into it, otherwise nothing will shift. So give your complete attention to what you feel and refrain from mentally labeling it. As you go into the feeling, be intensely alert. At first it may seem like a dark and terrifying place, and when the urge to turn away from it comes, observe it but don't act on it. Keep putting your attention on the pain, keep feeling the grief, the fear, the dread, the loneliness, whatever it is. Stay alert, stay present, present with your whole being, with every cell of your body. As you do so, you are bringing a light into this darkness. This is the flame of your consciousness. At this stage, you don't need to be concerned with surrender anymore. It has happened already. How? Full attention is full acceptance, is surrender. By giving full attention, you use the power of the now, which is the power of your presence. No hidden pocket of resistance can survive in it. Presence removes time. Without time, no suffering, no negativity can survive. The acceptance of suffering is a journey into death. Facing deep pain, allowing it to be, taking your attention into it, is to enter death consciously. When you have died this death, you realize that there is no death, and there is nothing to fear. Only the ego dies. Imagine a ray of sunlight that has forgotten it is an inseparable part of the sun and deludes itself into believing it has to fight for survival and create and cling to an identity other than the sun. Would the death of this delusion not be incredibly liberating? Do you want an easy death? Would you rather die without pain, without agony? Thought of as you. There are many accounts of people who say they have found God through their deep suffering. And there is the Christian expression, the way of the cross, which I suppose points to the same thing. We are concerned with nothing else here. Strictly speaking, they did not find God through their suffering, because suffering implies resistance. They found God through surrender, through total acceptance of what is, into which they were forced by their intense suffering. They must have realized on some level that their pain was self-created. How do you equate surrender with finding God? Since resistance is inseparable from the mind, relinquishment of resistance, surrender, is the end of the mind as your master, the imposter pretending to be you, the false god. All judgment and all negativity dissolve. The realm of being which had been obscured by the mind then opens up. Suddenly, a great stillness arises within you, an unfathomable sense of peace. And within that peace, there is great joy. And within that joy, there is love. And at the innermost core, there is the sacred, the immeasurable, that which cannot be named. I don't call it finding God, because how can you find that which was never lost, the very life that you are? The word God is limiting not only because of thousands of years of misperception and misuse, but also because it implies an entity other than you. God is being itself, not a being. There can be no subject-object relationship here, no duality, 
nor you and God. God-realization is the most natural thing there is. The amazing and incomprehensible fact is not that you can become conscious of God, but that you are not conscious of God. The way of the cross that you mentioned is the old way to enlightenment, and until recently it was the only way. But don't dismiss it or underestimate its efficacy. It still works. The way of the cross is a complete reversal. It means that the worst thing in your life, your cross, turns into the best thing that ever happened to you by forcing you into surrender, into death, forcing you to become as nothing, to become as God, because God, too, is no thing. At this time, as far as the unconscious majority of humans is concerned, the way of the cross is still the only way. They will only awaken through further suffering and enlightenment as a collective phenomenon will be predictably preceded by vast upheavals. This process reflects the workings of certain universal laws that govern the growth of consciousness and thus was foreseen by some seers. It is described, among other places, in the book of Revelation or Apocalypse, though cloaked in obscure and sometimes impenetrable symbology. This suffering is inflicted not by God, but by humans on themselves and on each other, as well as by certain defensive measures that the earth, which is a living, intelligent organism, is going to take to protect herself from the onslaught of human madness. However, there is a growing number of humans alive today whose consciousness is sufficiently evolved not to need any more suffering before the realization of enlightenment. You may be one of them. Enlightenment through suffering, the way of the cross, means to be forced into the kingdom of heaven kicking and screaming. You finally surrender because you can't stand the pain anymore, but the pain could go on for a long time until this happens. Enlightenment consciously chosen means to relinquish your attachment to past and future and to make the now the main focus of your life. It means choosing to dwell in the state of presence rather than in time. It means saying yes to what is. You then don't need pain anymore. How much more time do you think you will need before you are able to say, I will create no more pain, no more suffering? How much more pain do you need before you can make that choice? If you think that you need more time, you will get more time and more pain. Time and pain are inseparable. What about all those people who, it seems, actually want to suffer? I have a friend whose partner is physically abusive toward her, and her previous relationship was of a similar kind. Why does she choose such men, and why is she refusing to get out of that situation now? Why do so many people actually choose pain? I know that the word choose is a favorite New Age term, but it isn't entirely accurate in this context. It is misleading to say that somebody chose a dysfunctional relationship or any other negative situation in his or her life. Choice implies consciousness, a high degree of consciousness. Without it, you have no choice. Choice begins the moment you disidentify from the mind and its conditioned patterns, the moment you become present. Until you reach that point, you are unconscious, spiritually speaking. This means that you are compelled to think, feel and act in certain ways according to the conditioning of your mind. That is why Jesus said, Forgive them, for they know not what they do. This is not related to intelligence in the conventional sense of the word. I have met many highly intelligent and educated people who were also completely unconscious which is to say completely identified with their mind. In fact, if mental development and increased knowledge are not counterbalanced by a corresponding growth in consciousness, the potential for unhappiness and disaster is very great. 
Your friend is stuck in a relationship with an abusive partner and not for the first time. Why? No choice. The mind, conditioned as it is by the past, always seeks to recreate what it knows and is familiar with. Even if it is painful, at least it is familiar. The mind always adheres to the known. The unknown is dangerous because it has no control over it. That is why the mind dislikes and ignores the present moment. Present moment awareness creates a gap not only in the stream of mind, but also in the past-future continuum. Nothing truly new and creative can come into this world except through that gap, that clear space of infinite possibility. So your friend, being identified with her mind, may be recreating a pattern learned in the past in which intimacy and abuse are inseparably linked. Alternatively, she may be acting out a mind pattern learned in early childhood according to which she is unworthy and deserves to be punished. It is possible, too, that she lives a large part of her life through the pain body, which always seeks more pain on which to feed. Her partner has his own unconscious patterns which complement hers. Of course her situation is self-created, but who or what is the self that is doing the creating? A mental-emotional pattern from the past, no more. Why make a self out of it? If you tell her that she has chosen her condition or situation, you are reinforcing her state of mind identification. But is her mind pattern who she is? Is it herself? Is her true identity derived from the past? Show your friend how to be the observing presence behind her thoughts and her emotions. Tell her about the pain body and how to free herself from it. Teach her the art of inner body awareness. Demonstrate to her the meaning of presence. As soon as she is able to access the power of the now and thereby break through her conditioned past, she will have a choice. Nobody chooses dysfunction, conflict, pain. Nobody chooses insanity. They happen because there is not enough presence in you to dissolve the past, not enough light to dispel the darkness. You are not fully here. You have not quite woken up yet. In the meantime, the conditioned mind is running your life. Similarly, if you are one of the many people who have an issue with their parents, if you still harbor resentment about something they did or did not do, then you still believe that they had a choice, that they could have acted differently. It always looks as if people had a choice, but that's an illusion. As long as your mind with its conditioned patterns runs your life, as long as you are your mind, what choice do you have? None. You are not even there. The mind-identified state is severely dysfunctional. It is a form of insanity. Almost everyone is suffering from this illness in varying degrees. The moment you realize this, there can be no more resentment. How can you resent someone's illness? The only appropriate response is compassion. So that means nobody is responsible for what they do? I don't like that idea. If you are run by your mind, although you have no choice, you will still suffer the consequences of your unconsciousness and you will create further suffering. You will bear the burden of fear, conflict, problems and pain. The suffering thus created will eventually force you out of your unconscious state. What you say about choice also applies to forgiveness, I suppose. You need to be fully conscious and surrender before you can forgive. Forgiveness is a term that has been in use for 2,000 years, but most people have a very limited view of what it means. You cannot truly forgive yourself or others, as long as you derive your sense of self from the past. Only through accessing the power of the now, which is your own power, can there be true forgiveness. This renders the past powerless, and you realize deeply that nothing you ever did, or that was ever done to you, 
could touch even in the slightest the radiant essence of who you are. The whole concept of forgiveness then becomes unnecessary. And how do I get to that point of realization? When you surrender to what is and so become fully present, the past ceases to have any power. You do not need it anymore. Presence is the key. The now is the key. How will I know when I have surrendered? When you no longer need to ask the question. <laughs> 